Matthew Bell here with Alzheimer'sProof.com. Today I am continuing a series on improving brain function. And this is, it's roughly a three-part division to the series in the way I've got it in my mind. The first part is, is the dietary and herbal considerations. So that is basically what I'm calling part one, even though that's two parts. The second part of it in terms of overall divisions has to do with uh, brain exercises, brain teasers and the like of this that some researchers suggest might help to improve cognitive function or delay the onset of dementia. These discussions are going to dovetail with things like causes and risk factors, things that I've discussed in other videos, and as always you can consult my written resources on alzheimersproof.com for further information if anything sparks your interest. I need to have the usual uh, disclaimer, that is I am not a doctor, I am not a medical professional of any kind, I am not a lawyer, I, I'm not giving you professional uh, advice here or recommendations in terms of uh, that, that are specifically tailored to you. I'm not treating, prescribing anything. This video is for general informational or entertainment purposes only and my aim really is that you will start to sort of uh, be able to see the lay of the land and if there's something that you would like to explore further you will have some um, some tips and some hints as to where you can go to get further information. A lot of the discussion of these sorts of brain teasers, crosswords, and other kinds of mental exercises are going to be based on the piece of advice put it generally uh, and to put it uh, roughly that if you don't use it you're going to lose it. So this use it or lose it idea just helps you kind of get a fix on the whole kind of thrust of what these recommendations are basically for from those who make them, these suggestions for you. And that is is that if you don't use your mind then you're going to start to have certain mental functions atrophy basically like a muscle might atrophy if you don't exercise. Now whether this is strictly literally true or not I'm not going to take a position on that. I don't have any idea. Again, as I've stated in other videos, for me personally, Alzheimer's runs on both sides of my family. My dad died of it in 2016, and when my grandma passed earlier this year, 2019, she had Alzheimer's. She didn't die from the Alzheimer's specifically, but she died with it. So I certainly have an interest in trying to avoid Alzheimer's, and if dietary changes and herbal additions and a few of these mental exercises can help me to either avoid it altogether or to push it back as far as possible, then it's worth it to me. And I, and I share that. Um, I share these tips with you. If, if you have the same disposition as I do, then I hope that you find something of use in these, in these tips. I would ask that you like the video and subscribe to the channel. It certainly does help with the reach that we are trying to get. One of the aims that I have in doing this entire project is to basically provide this kind of information to as broad an audience as possible. Uh, there are over 5 million people in the United States alone who have Alzheimer's disease. Worldwide, that figure is upwards of 40 million, and uh, it is expected to triple over the next uh, few decades. So part of the aim of the channel is to try, as I put on my website, to try to provide people and families with cutting-edge information and research leads so that they have the uh, power that they need to make decisions that are in the best interest of them and their loved ones for the future. Without further ado, though, I'm going to give you my list of 12 things, 12 exercises that experts recommend often that you can do for your brain in order to stay active, stay mentally vigorous, and possibly delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease. Number one is board games and card games. So board games and card games, um, a number of these are going to be uh, board games, but in this case uh, we're talking about uh, almost, almost any kind of board game. Uh, my kids like to play uh, Risk. Uh, when I was little, uh, my, my dad uh, used to like to play Monopoly. He played uh, Gin Rummy as a, as a card game. I know a number of, uh, of people in retirement who play Bridge. They might have a poker night. It, it, it seems like in a lot of cases it's less important what the game is and just that you are using your brain to uh, evaluate the cards that you have, to try and come up with some kind of a strategy, to remember uh, the different hands and what they mean. All of these different things are going to give your brain a workout. And in fact, uh, at least one study linked uh, board and card game players with larger brain size. And this is actually uh, correlated with something that is in fancy terminology called cognitive reserve. And this is explained and defined in a number of different ways, but one sort of way of thinking of it is, is that you have more brain matter 
than you strictly speaking need for the tasks that you perform daily. And it sounds kind of weird to say it like that, but when you think of it like that, basically what it means is, is that you have redundancies, that there are certain areas of the brain that can kick in and compensate for other areas of the brain that may be damaged. So Alzheimer's is a brain degenerating disease, a neuro uh, degenerating disease that affects nerves and brain cells. And what this cognitive reserve might mean in relation to Alzheimer's is that a person with more cognitive reserve can take damage to their brain without noticing that or without it being obvious because they have other areas of the brain that are able to come in and compensate for those losses. Number two, brain teasers. So brain teasers are riddles and puzzles and quizzes that are designed to sort of uh, be solved as, uh, as you see, as you find clues maybe, or uh, maybe there's a mystery to solve there. But the idea behind brain teasers essentially is that these are going to give your brain a workout. The Wall Street Journal had an article about the effect of brain teasers. And according to that, they are able in some cases to delay the onset of dementia. Now I'm going to give a caveat. There's going to be a running theme here of delaying the onset of dementia. And in order to evaluate this, scientists, generally speaking, are going to have to have a population and they're going to have to track the population over time. Some people are going to get dementia. Some people are not going to get dementia. And in other words, they have to look at groups of people because obviously you can't take one and the same person and run their whole life forward where they don't play uh, board games and they don't do brain teasers and then you see ah well when they don't play board games that person gets Alzheimer's disease at 65 and then redo their life and then now with board games and brain teasers they don't get Alzheimer's until age 70. Obviously we can't run an experiment like that. So what has to happen is we have to compare groups of people. Some who are game players, some are not, some who get Alzheimer's and some who don't. And the essential uh, way that those pieces of data, just generally speaking, are evaluated is you say, oh, right, in the group of people who play board games, they tend, when they get Alzheimer's, to get it a little bit later in life than those who don't play board games. However, obviously, there could be factors that aren't considered in the study that really ultimately account for the differences. So even though these uh, findings are suggestive, they're certainly not definitive. Number three is checkers. So here is a kind of board game, but like the next one, checkers is unique and uh, certainly well known and evaluated in different studies on its own. And I thought I would throw it in as a separate item. Some studies suggest that checkers can actually boost brain strength. Checkers, uh, like the next game that I'm going to mention in a moment, is a game that basically helps to develop basic strategy. And again, like some of the card uh, games that we surveyed earlier or briefly mentioned, uh, checkers basically is going to require that you have uh, that you think maybe a move or two ahead, and when you're when you're playing the game well anyway, and that's going to encourage a lot of different brain functions to come into play when you're playing checkers. You're going to have to remember you know, the rules of the board. You're going to have to remember what side you're on. You're going to have to sort of try and trap the opponent. And so a lot of things can come into play. And number four, similar to number three, is chess. So the game of chess, again, like the game of checkers, is a board game. This game goes back many hundreds of years. Chess specifically has, in some, art in some articles that I read, been linked to a, quote, 30% reduction in Alzheimer's risk. For additional information on Alzheimer's risk factors, I invite you to see my website, alzheimersproof.com. I also have a video dedicated to exploring some of the risk factors. I invite you to check that out as well. Number five, crosswords. Uh, this is probably the one you've been waiting for. This is kind of in folk wisdom to save off Alzheimer's disease, do crossword puzzles. I know my grandma did crossword puzzles for many years and you know she died at the age of 94. My dad passed at the age of 85. But um, basically with uh, crossword puzzles, you're going to have to solve you know, questions. You're going to have to answer questions. You're going to have to arrange letters on the uh, on the page, and uh, this is going to bring some language faculties and other things like that into play. Memory, reasoning ability is going to come into play. And according to at least one study, uh, doing working crossword puzzles actually can delay the onset of dementia by an average of two and a half years among the people who were who were surveyed. Number six is language. And we touched on this with crosswords. This kind of gets us into language a little bit, but language, both learning a new language as well as being bilingual, are both correlated with later onset of dementia and also lower 
risk. In fact, bilingualism in one uh, study that I, that I looked at was able to delay the onset of dementia by four to six years. So people who were bilingual had later incidences of onset of dementia, including Alzheimer's, than people who were not bilingual. Similarly, learning a new language can also help to delay. One of the things that I think I've uh, come to believe as I was looking at this information is that it's, it's better late than never. So you might be sitting thinking like many Americans, perhaps if you're in the United States watching this video, you might think, well, uh, I'm monolingual, I've only spoken one language all my life. Well, you might want to just uh, begin to kind of pick up another language. It can help. One of the speculations was that people who have uh, two languages, command of two languages, have to constantly police themselves, in a sense, as to uh, word selection, because they may have two different words from two different languages that they, that they know. And the supposition is that this sort of uh, self-reflection that may happen when you have to choose the right word can help with executive function and other kinds of things that tend to be affected with Alzheimer's disease. So the idea is that learning a second language or being bilingual can help you improve or can help you have a robust executive function and that that might give you some protection against Alzheimer's. Again, there's a causal direction. I talk about this in the video about causation, but with cause, cause is a tricky thing. Uh, it can be mistaken for correlation and there can also be problems with causal direction. So one might think that if you are bilingual you have less of a chance of having Alzheimer's, but you might also think that a person who has less of a chance of having Alzheimer's is more likely to be bilingual. And so the causal direction is not clear and like so many of the things, like everything on this list, you might have to take it with a grain of salt, but it, the findings are suggestive, but they're not ironclad, they're not definitive by any means. Still, some researchers do speak of the protective effect of bilingualism. Number seven is music. Now, I have written on alzheimersproof.com about the use of music in helping to calm an agitated Alzheimer's uh, patient. It can also be helpful in memory exercises. My dad used to love to listen to music that he remembered from when he was a, a young uh, person, and that seemed to stimulate and, uh, and provoke memories in him even when his short-term memory had, had all but failed him. But in this case, we're talking about learning an instrument, we're talking about playing an instrument, and both of those two things are correlated with reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease. Number eight is puzzles. Now, we talked about brain teasers, um, but this kind of puzzle, I mean a jigsaw puzzle, so a puzzle that you actually physically assemble. And this can help with, with motor skills, it can help with reasoning, it can help with memory, it can help with sort of uh, visual, spatial, cognitive abilities. And in general, being engaged in putting together puzzles can just help keep your mind active and sharp. Number nine is reading. This could be reading newspapers, reading magazines, reading books, reading of all kinds. Online is a little bit of its own thing. There are many people who suggest that reading online tends to be very different than reading printed material. But without getting into that in this video, let's simply say that reading of any kind is better than not reading from the standpoint of trying to guard against Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. It can help preserve brain function, protect brain function, and also support overall brain health according to some researchers. Number 10 is social interaction. This is a recognition of the fact that human beings are social animals, that we are designed, made, evolved to interact in, in groups with other human beings. And when we're deprived of that, we tend to not thrive or flourish. So the idea here is that the more contact you can have with other people, the more, the more conversations you might get into, the more interactions you have, the more it supports your overall brain health and brain function. Some studies even rank social interaction as more beneficial than some of the other brain teasers, crosswords, and games that we have on this list. Number 11, I'm gonna do this, I'm not sure how to represent 11 here, but number 11 is gonna be Sudoku. Sudoku is a kind of a number puzzle it's laid out similarly to a crossword puzzle. It's generally a nine by nine grid, and the objective is to arrange the, the numerals in particular ways, and uh, it, can, it can really benefit, according to some researchers, it can really benefit your cognitive health. In fact, for people aged 50 to 93, and whatever study uh, was actually uh, examining this, 
people who did these number puzzles had overall higher cognitive function than people who did not. So if math is your thing, you might gravitate towards one of these number puzzles. If language is more in your wheelhouse, then crosswords and, and uh, some other things are maybe better suited for you. Number 12 is working. So here we literally mean working as in going to your job. It can provide the social interaction, depending on your job. It can provide opportunities to reason, opportunities to remember, opportunities to problem solve, and this kind of thing, which basically give your brain a kind of a workout. Now, caveats on this are that if your job is very stressful, or if you find your job to be soul-sucking, essentially, then the stress that you get from your job might not really be serving you well in terms of overall health. But if you appreciate your job, or if you like your job, or what have you, then just the social interaction together with some of the cognitive exercises that you would have just as part of your normal day-to-day -day job can actually help to support your brain health and delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease. Now there are three views as to whether or not these things are, are helpful. And the first view is they're helpful. The second view is they're neither helpful nor harmful. They don't do anything. And the third view actually is they can be harmful. And I'm just gonna quickly speak about each of these in turn. Obviously, if these exercises are helpful, then it would be wise to incorporate at least a few of them into your routine if you are interested, as I am, in trying to delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease. Now, if they do nothing, uh, then we might be wasting our time. But I would say that there is a sense in which some of these activities just have the ability to reduce stress or they have the ability to be enjoyable in and of themselves. So even if they don't do anything with respect to Alzheimer's disease, some people might still enjoy doing these activities. But of course, we're focused on Alzheimer's prevention or Alzheimer's delaying. So if they turn out to be ineffective, that would be a shame, obviously, from the point of view of trying to manage controllable factors that might increase your risk for Alzheimer's disease. But I would say the main thing about this right now is the literature and the, the data is not certainly not against their effectiveness. Some people might doubt that the uh, information that they are effective is compelling enough to prompt us to say, yeah, these definitely will help you to delay or to uh, reduce your risk for Alzheimer's disease. The, the information that we have and the data that we have is certainly not compelling. But it's not compelling that they're not effective either. So I would say because they can have other effects that are positive, stress reduction, helping to boost brain function just in general, and because there's certainly not scientific data that shows conclusively that they're not effective, I'm gonna err on the side of, let me try these things and at least bring them in a little bit into my life uh, because they still might be effective. But finally, the most interesting position here are those people who suggest that some of these things might actually be harmful. Now, I've written about this on alzheimersproof.com and you can sort of see in greater depth some of my responses to a few of the commonly heard objections. But I should say that this was a position when I encountered it that was somewhat surprising to me that I, I expected that somebody might say, well, they might be ineffective but it was surprising that there are people who seemingly put forth the idea that some of these can actually be harmful. So I just want to bring it to your attention and kind of uh, sketch a few uh, possible replies. So one reason a person might object is because they think that these things might give false hope to a family or to a person. So here I think the thought is if a person's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and you say, well, you know what, you might be able to uh, help by doing crossword puzzles, or you might be able to delay Alzheimer's onset by doing crossword puzzles. Uh, the idea is, is that people might be disappointed if they end up declining anyway. And I think here it's important to simply have realistic expectations. I don't think that this is a reason to not do these brain exercises, but certainly a reason to really reflect and understand that Obviously, brain degeneration is a physical uh, happening to the brain. It, it, brain degeneration is something physical happening to the brain. And so using the brain, it, it is intuitive that that might help cognitive function, but it's not clear that these things are actually going to reverse damage, that they could reverse damage to the brain, or that they could prevent physical damage to the brain. As long as you have realistic expectations, I think that this concern about false hope 
can be somewhat diffused or sidestepped. Another concern is that these things may not generalize. So there is a, a thing called cognitive training or brain training. And this is where uh, people might run through various memory exercises or various processing speed exercises or reasoning exercises or what have you. And the idea that they don't generalize might be summed by saying something like this is that if you train to increase processing speed, it may not affect memory. And if you train to increase memory, it may not affect reasoning ability. So the idea of not generalizing means that you might have developed, if you go through some of these trainings or your loved one does, they might develop a kind of a technical competence in one area that doesn't really help them all that much in other areas. And again, I think like the false hope concern, this is, uh, it is resolved, I believe, by simply having realistic expectations about what these things are capable of doing. So if you think that having better processing speed or a more enhanced memory or trained reasoning capacity is better than not having processing speed, memory, and reasoning ability that is a little bit more than it would have been, then I think it would still be beneficial for a person to pursue some of these training exercises. There's no magic, uh, there's no silver bullet, this is not going to be this quick fix or this, this magical fix for a person's uh, cognitive or brain health, but I think that um, we, we shouldn't get so down about the fact that, well, maybe they don't generalize and, and we cause that to um, dissuade us from even attempting some of these exercises. I, I, I personally think that's a mistake. Another concern that I thought was interesting here was the idea that if we think that brain exercise can help to delay or reduce the risk of Alzheimer's, then there's a danger that we might blame the victim. That is to say, similar to if you smoke, you are at greater risk for lung cancer, and so somebody might say, well, if you turn out to have lung cancer and you smoked, to some degree, we can say that you are blameworthy because you put yourself at greater risk than you would have been had you not smoked. And so the idea here is, is that if brain exercises can help delay Alzheimer's disease and a person ends up with Alzheimer's disease, that we might say, well, they should have worked out their brain more or something. And, and I see that this can be a concern. I would simply again say that the way I'm approaching this is as a bet. Um, I think it is fair for people to take the position that these exercises simply do not have the benefits that some researchers suppose. And if you've gone through the literature and you've made your rational determination that these things are likely to be ineffective, then there really is no blame to be assessed to you if you choose to not engage in these things. So for instance, if you think, you know what, brain teasers, they're not gonna help me with Alzheimer's, I, I don't think chess is gonna help me or reading is gonna help me, and so you choose consciously to not do these sorts of things because you, you literally think the evidence points to the conclusion that they're ineffective, then you're not blameworthy from a rational standpoint. You've done your due diligence and you've simply come to a different conclusion. I don't think that that is blameworthy. Now, on the other hand, if a person looks at these things and says, you know what, I can see that these things are likely beneficial or possibly beneficial, and then that person chooses not to engage in them uh, because of a lack of concern for their own well-being or their own cognitive health, we might think of that a little bit differently, but then interestingly, if the concern is supposed to be that it is unkind to blame somebody and a person looks at their own well-being and says, you know what, I just don't care enough, it's not clear to me that there is going to be this kind of hurt feeling uh, that, that the objection seems to assume will occur. So if I literally say, you know what, I just don't care about myself, I'm not good. I think chess and reading and, and brain teasers may very well push the onset of Alzheimer's back for me, but I don't care. It's not clear that blaming me for that is going to hurt my feelings if I do take that position. So this is kind of an odd objection I, I, to me. I think it's more emotional. I think we obviously should be kind. But again, my aim is to make a bet and to try and live my life in such a way as to maximize my health and reduce my risk of Alzheimer's disease. So for me personally, I don't find this objection very uh, compelling and certainly not a compelling reason for me to not explore these options. The last objection that I'll tackle here is the idea that these things can actually speed up Alzheimer's or dementia later in life. Now this is an interesting objection. I think that it is wrong-headed. Um, and I've gone into greater detail of this in my written work on alzheimersproof.com. But essentially the point that I think should be made is that some of these techniques 
insofar as they push the onset of Alzheimer's back. What they end up doing on the one hypothesis is compressing your experience or your loved one's experience of the disease. Now, if you decline over a period of 10 years, let's say, if a person develops Alzheimer's, let's say at age 70 and they die at age 80, then their experience of Alzheimer's disease, assuming they are onset at 70, is going to be stretched over 10 years. So assuming that they die at age 80, if their Alzheimer's is, the onset is pushed back from age 70, let's say to age 75, then what is being done is to compress the experience of the disease into a five-year period instead of into a 10-year period. But insofar as they die at age 80, if we assume that that is a fixed thing, and again, I mean, this is a really odd way of thinking here, but if we assume that that's fixed, then the reason that their Alzheimer's degree, seems to be speeded up compared to a person who has it over a longer period of time is because of that compression. It's because the degeneration that occurs occurs over five years instead of over 10 years. So the, the slope of that is, is a bit steeper, if you want to call it that. Now, it, it is, to be sure, a very odd way of thinking, but I think... Number one, that the idea that it speeds up the decline is simply a mathematical artifact. I don't think that it is, it's not the case, I think, that a person who goes through these brain exercises is somehow worse off than they would have been otherwise. It's rather, if anything, that their experience of the disease is compressed over a shorter period of time, and so the, the uh, rate of their decline is accelerated, apparently, over what it would have been had they not had a later onset of the disease. This is, gets somewhat convoluted, but I would say, if you're interested in pursuing this a little more, to check out my written work on alzheimersproof.com. I have a little graph that I think maybe can help to clarify at least some of what these researchers might be thinking about. But on the other hand, somebody might suggest that speeding up the experience of the disease or compressing it has a number of benefits. Number one, the person doesn't suffer for as long. You maximize their mental health so that they end up functioning more highly for longer. And in addition to that, it can save on money and also caretaker stress because they don't have to be cared for for quite some time, for quite as long. So the idea that it speeds it up, I think, is a bit misleading. I think it's a mathematical artifact. And in fact, if the onset is pushed back, it actually appears to me to be a good thing, to be honest. Now, in summary here, I'm going to just give a few practical conclusions. So we've talked about a number of things. We've talked about board games and brain teasers, checkers and chess, and we've talked about reading and social interaction and working. But overall, a few takeaways. Number one is that it's good to train the overall brain. The more uh, you can bring into an exercise, the more beneficial it will be for you. You want to do this consistently. It's not something that you just want to pick up here or there. The idea is to make this part of your life, to do some of these brain exercises maybe two times a, a week, three times a week, um, 100 hours a week, 120 hours, 150 hours a week, like you're, like you're training your body. You wouldn't just work out one time a month. Um, you would work out consistently in order to improve your physical health. The third uh, takeaway really is that novelty is a key here. Um, to give your brain new tasks, new experiences, new problems to solve. You know, if you're a reader and you enjoy fiction, try nonfiction or vice versa. So I think the use it or lose it uh, mentality is a good sort of uh, motivator. I think you should also bear in mind that it's better late than never. It's never too late to start. Um, you know, uh, I think I could have started earlier to pick up some of these techniques and to use them but I'm gonna implement them now in the hopes that they may benefit me in the future. But there is no magic, there's no silver bullet. You have to have realistic expectations. You have to realize that the data is still inconclusive. The jury is still out as to the actual effectiveness or ineffectiveness of these techniques. I recommend um, just the same uh, strategy that I have, which is simply I'm betting. I'm trying to bet on my health, and it seems to me that mental engagement is a better bet than mental uh, apathy or disengage. But this has to be fitted in a context of overall health. So diet is important, and nutrition, uh, sleeping habits are going to be important, physical exercise will be important, and I talk about these in other places. If you have found something of use in this video, please like the video, please subscribe to the channel, check out my written work on alzheimersproof.com, and I thank you so much for being with me today.